The Iranian Revolution of 1979 was one of the most significant revolutions. It is called the Third Great Revolution following the French and Russian revolutions. It led to the establishment of the clerical regime still standing in Iran today, one characterised by terror and authoritarian religious leadership. The revolution started as an effort to overthrow the Pahlavi monarchy at the time under Mohammad Reza Shah, but the movement took on religious colouring under the leadership of Ayatollah Khomeini, who set up a new kind of government run by clerics. Before the Pahlavi dynasty, there was the Qajar and Safavid dynasties. They gave Iran its distinctive character. During the Safavid and Qajar dynasties, the Persian identity was revived. The Safavid introduced Shia Islam into the empire, and this was significant as it brought Persians into their own sphere and separated them from the Sunnit Arab population. The Shia, as a minority in a vastly Sunni Muslim world population, think of themselves as an oppressed people while working towards restoring social justice as set by the Prophet. So since the Safavid Empire, the Persian identity was based around a religion that at its core was revolutionary. It was a religion of an oppressed people working for change. Furthermore, this connection between Shi'ism and social justice would be a key mobilising rhetoric in the revolution centuries later, an aspect of Iranian culture that would be tapped into by the clerics in Ayatollah Khomeini. During the Qajar dynasties, when the clerics, who are religious leaders, were given political power and position they would maintain in the 20th century, the ulama became a highly influential tier with political authority independent from the state. The clerics were seen as needed in order to guide society and to interpret the Islamic scripts. This new role of social leadership for the clerics gave them a foothold in politics and in the economy. The people would pay them a portion of their earnings, look at them for guidance, law and justice. Over the centuries, the clerical class was reinforced in wealth and power, whilst the monarchies declined in influence and tended to be relatively weak. Clerics were in charge of religious law, which was a large part of everyday life. It included authority over things like marriage, divorce, inheritance, family disputes, business, etc. Although they were often the authority figure in towns and villages, they also had a personal connection to the people through the Friday prayer leaders who had direct contact with the people on a weekly basis. There was a complex relationship of authority that was in close relation to society rather than a distant monarch in his high palace who lived so differently to the people. The clerics were such an important factor in social movements and protests. They had a certain level of immunity given their power and independence from the state. And also physically, the high level clerics often lived out in religious centres like Qom or Najaf, far away from the reach of the government. Meanwhile, their connection with the people enabled them to mobilise movements. There are multiple examples of when the clerics helped organise movements against the state and utilised their position in society. The most important is the 1905-11 Constitutional Revolution. The 1905-11 Constitutional Revolution was a movement started by clerics and intellectuals who fought for a constitution to put laws down on paper and end the unrestricted rule of the Qajar monarchy. The Constitutional Revolution set up a parliamentary government which had a short success. The revolution ultimately failed for several reasons, such as the clerics removing their support and the Qajars had help from Russia to reassert its dominance and kill the movement in 1911, but it sowed the seeds for the 1979 revolution. After World War I, the British helped a military colonel, Reza Khan, gain power. He was the first king of the Pahlavi dynasty. He was a dictator that enforced censorship and brutality. In 1941, he abdicated and his son Mohammad Reza Shah became the new monarch. Mohammad Reza Shah would be the king that the 1979 revolution toppled. He relaxed censorship and in doing so allowed for different political groups to develop, such as Communist Tudeh Party and the Nationalists known as the National Front. It is in this time that there were many developments of politics among the Iranian population. People were becoming more politically active and tuned into how their country was being run and the issues they were facing. In the early 1950s, the Prime Minister Mossadegh, part of the National Front, nationalised the oil industry. Oil generated huge revenues for the Iranian economy, and this money was used by the king to finance his big projects such as building his army, weaponry, industry, etc. But before the nationalisation of oil, the British owned a majority of the Iranian oil industry. This meant that even though the oil was in Iran and belonged to Iran, they took home a smaller share of the money than the British. This was seen as a sort of imperialism to the Iranians and so Mossadegh by nationalising the oil industry making it belong to the Iranians was very popular but this was at the expense of the British who lost their cheap oil supply. In 
In 1953, the CIA and the British Intelligence Service coordinated a plan to stage a coup to oust Mossadegh. The Americans felt he wasn't anti-communist enough given that many communist to death followers supported him and the British were concerned about their oil. Mossadegh was ousted from his position. Demonstrations against him were also organised by clerics who felt his support from the communist to death party was a threat. Mohammad Reza Shah was not a confident leader. He was educated in the West, favoured Western culture and was out of touch with his people. He relied on the brutality of his secret police, the Savak, to keep opposition in check. He lacked political know-how and relied on his right-hand man, Alam, to help him with his lack of experience. And after the 1953 coup against Mossadegh, the people did not trust him. In the early 1960s, in fear of a red revolution from below, he set up a white revolution, a revolution from above to modernise and reform industry, agriculture and military before the people might revolt from below, such as in Russia. He was closely tied to the Americas and admired their advanced technology, using oil revenues he spent excessively on advanced weapon technology. He carried out extensive land reforms that brought in a new farming technology from the West. The issue was that advanced machines from the West were, funny enough, designed for the West, Mohammad Reza Shah had the mindset of West is best and did not give a second thought to Iran's specific needs. For example, where places like America had vast amounts of fertile land and a small workforce, they need mechanisation of farming to be able to farm the land with fewer people. But Iran had a large workforce in comparison to its small area of farmable lands. This meant that when the Shah brought in farming technology, many peasants were unemployed and forced into cities to find work. Meanwhile in the cities, the Shah financed new industries, but there was a mass migration of peasants to the cities, such as a high rate, that there was not time to invest in building the needed housing, amenities or sanitation. Furthermore, even in the cities, there were not enough jobs for all the rural migrants. The rural peasants enjoyed a village community. With close communal relationships, employment through working the land were forced into the cities alienated, isolated from the culture they once knew and living in unsanitary, poor conditions. In addition to all this, the Shah was spending excessively on the military. He liked to buy advanced weapons, planes and equipment which only heightened inflation, which increased prices for the peasants already living in squalor. The white revolution, although it seemingly generated money in terms of the industry for the economy, it was not trickling down to the poorer classes. It only increased the inequality between the elite and the rest of the population. The Shah was seen as a Western-loving autocrat who lived in luxury and who seemed to look down on Iranian culture and identity, whilst the Iranians lived in poverty and had to deal with increasing influence from America and Britain. The 1979 revolution came out of this context, a context of one, an established clerical class that had a foothold in politics, the economy and in society at the village level as well. They were important in mobilising movements and in tying them back to their own power and interests. They also represented the link between Shiism and revolutionary attitudes as the Shiism as a way to combat what they called social injustices. 2. A history of encroaching Western influence in Iran brewed animosity amongst the people. They felt their unique Iranian identity that is built around being Shia and being Persian was being forcibly replaced by American and Western culture, as well as their politics and their economy being guided by Western interests. 3. It came out of a country being ruled by an autocrat who was out of touch with his country and his people and who worsened their everyday standing. This white revolution created poverty and alienation. Lastly, the first Iranian revolution of the 20th century, the Constitutional Revolution, sowed the seeds of political thought and democracy. Meanwhile, its failure left unresolved issues to crop up again in 1979.